big metaphysics. I need people to understand what I am doing. Why do I need that? Well, for plenty of reasons that are all explained in my metaphysics. The problem is, it's a fairly huge undertaking to lay it all out. And it's largely still in my head, it's not on paper. I mean, I have, I've written down lots of little notes, but I want a big visual. I want a big ass piece of paper. As big as this whole wall. And that big paper represents the set of all things. Now, here's the deal. The first thing before you go any further is to define for people what you're doing because people don't understand what it is I'm doing and they think I'm doing something other than what I'm doing what I am doing is making a model what does that mean well Let's start by explaining it like this. A model predicts behavior explains relationships between things in a way that makes intuitive sense and doesn't produce contradictions within its own system of rules. What are the elements within a model? What am I making? What am I playing with here? Well, you've got axioms in a model, which you would say fundamental rules that apply always that If something in the system contradicts an axiom, then either the system's bad, you know, it's bad input, or three, you need to adapt the system to account for these contradictory results, so to speak. In other words, let's say I were trying to explain how fish live underwater where there's no air. And I had a model that said this. Well, clearly fish don't need air. They, whatever it is that the human body and animals on land do with air, who knows what that is, but obviously we need it because <coughs> we know from experience, from a personal experience, if you hold your breath too long, it starts to feel very uncomfortable. And we know from narratives that people can be suffocated. Maybe we even know from personal experience by either doing it to somebody or by watching somebody else do it to somebody. Probably that's a very small population of people who have either suffocated someone or watched someone be suffocated. But in theory, that's possible, right? So you've got multiple reasons to believe that we need air. But let's say I didn't have all these sciencey explanations. And I'm trying to figure it out why. Well, we need air to talk. That's obvious. I really can't talk without letting any air out. Okay. And deer, they need air to make whatever little sound they make. In fact, everything on land makes a sound. And nothing in the water makes a sound. I've got it. My model is this. 
look, the reason a fish can live underwater, even though there's no air down there, is because the reason we need air is because we can talk, make noises. If we couldn't make noises, we wouldn't need to breathe. And fish can't make noises, so they don't need to breathe. That explains it. Do, 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 do. Okay, that's a model that explains the whys of things. That says, here's an explanation. And the model basically is, things that make noise <laughs> need to breathe. Because they have to breathe out air to make noise and that fish, they don't need to make noise, and they don't make noise, so they don't need to breathe. So that's why they can live underwater, but we can't. Okay, so if I were going to examine, test that model for soundness, the first thing I would say is, okay, so Fish don't need to breathe because they don't make sounds. So based on your model then, we should be able to bring fish out of the water and they should be fine on land, right? Because after all, it's not that they're in the water because they have to be. It's in the water because they're in the water because they don't need to breathe. They, they, they have that special advantage over us. So we take a fish out of the water and test it. Now, well, but say I with my model, maybe the fish died of some alternate cause. It could be the fish was old when you brought it out of the water and the shock of it coming out of the water gave it a heart attack. So, you know, I don't think the fact that it came out of the water, uh, it, it's not it's not unreasonable to think that the fish would be very surprised by that if you go in getting it and bring it out of the water so obviously it's going to have a health problems associated with that experience a lot of surprise <laughs> too much surprise is bad for your health okay fine i guess that doesn't disprove your model but it doesn't support it it's not consistent with it all right let's see what else hmm well if I can show you an animal that lives on land that needs to breathe and doesn't make any audible noises out of their mouth with air, then I will have disproved your warrant that that is why we need to breathe. Because if, if without the ability to talk we wouldn't, or make noises, we wouldn't need to breathe, then anything that doesn't have that ability doesn't need to breathe. So, if I can kind of identify an animal on land that needs to breathe, and I can show you that it's breathing, like I would like to say like a slug or something, but it's hard to demonstrate that thing's breathing, right? Um, let's see. It doesn't make a sound. An animal that doesn't make a sound. I think there's some kind of barkless dog or something. I don't know. Maybe I, there's got to be some animal that doesn't make any sound. Any like you know vocalization, um, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, let's say there is. I demonstrate one. Well, there I've disproved that part of your your thing. And in that case, I really have disproved it. It's not just like well, I mean, okay, I guess it doesn't prove anything, but I really have because I've given an example that disproves that generalization. Now note, the generalization may still be generally true, but um, that doesn't do this person any good, right? They're looking for a single explanation as to why fish can live under water where there's no air. And an explanation that says, well, some of the fish, you know, live under water with no air for reasons other than ability to make noise while others do that makes no sense at all there needs to be a single explanation for it right 
And in fact, there is, that they have these organs called gills that what they do is when water goes through them, they take the air out of the water. So they are breathing air down there, just like we are. Okay, there's a good model. That makes sense. Is it true? Well, now we're getting into the meat of the conversation. Somebody will try to argue that that model is more true than the model I'm going to talk about, which is the philosophy model. And the reason it's more true is because we have a physical reference to compare it against. So we'd say, okay, well, um, your model, Eric, we can't test it in the same way. Yes, you can. Absolutely, you can. The thing is, consistency with existing understandings of meaning or whatever is the same, whether it's referring to a physical thing or not. And if you think about it, that example I gave you right there about a model that explains some function in the physical world almost immediately left the physical world. It's entirely an abstraction. To say that we have a referent in the physical world, well, it's no different whatsoever from the referent in the physical world that I have in my philosophy model. Um, which I'm tempted to name talking with famous everything. Mm, no. What is my name of my theory? Eric's big theory? <laughs> no, you gotta have a fancy sounding man. I really want everyone to understand what my theory is. So anyway, that's where I would start with is what am I doing? Okay, well I'm making a model. So what does that mean? Well, look, it's it's how you understand the world. That's what it means. It's like it's why you think that that fish are can, are actually breathing air underwater rather than be, that they don't have to breathe because they're underwater and there's no air down there. Well, what difference does that make in anyone's life? In that particular model, not very much. That's my point. Philosophy models are more real, more true, and more impactful upon people's lives and subsume, most importantly, those science models. So, I mean, I love those science models. I think they're great. Note that almost none of us have done anything remotely close to an active test of those models of our own in terms of a physical world, real world, laboratory uh, model test. And yet, we still have each of us tested the model and found it sound. Why? Because it's consistent with other things that we know to be true. In fact, the reality we walk around with every day is comprised entirely of narratives whose validity is determined by their consistency with other sets of narratives. And on a larger sense, the sets of narratives achieve legitimacy based upon I mean really what it's based upon is going to be or has to be consistency with the grand purpose and we don't know, can't possibly know exactly what the grand purpose is, right? But I would deem it set completion. Um, 
it's enough to know that there is a grand purpose for me. I believe there is. There has to be. Look, understand this. Here's a part of the theory, right? <coughs> it continues developing. There's basically one. Okay. You can divide the universe into three things space, time, and agency. Space, time, and life. Okay? Those are the. Everything falls under one of those three general domains, except the fourth thing is not so much a domain, but rather an overarching principle slash first purpose. People evaluate in metaphysics a lot issues of causality. And I remember growing up thinking a lot about first cause arguments. Um, my dad always talked to me about stuff like that. And I'd take it outside and uh, I'd just picture myself going, you know, it makes me emotional. I thought so hard about it, and my little brain wasn't ready to deal with it. I just couldn't get it. I couldn't get it back then, at all. When I think about old childhood philosophical stuff, it makes me emotional. <sighs> it's like a song from your childhood or something, you know? First cause arguments. I mean, who ever talks about first cause arguments anymore, you know? It's weird how an era, a time period, has its own little philosophical trends. Like, I think I think it's fair to say that 70s and 80s, you know, were still sort of lolling around in first cause arguments. They hadn't even gotten to the clockmaker's files yet. <laughs> Stupid 70s and 80s. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I remember sitting about the time thinking about that shit so hard, man. And getting so wanting so bad to already know it right that I I fight against trying to figure it out like wanting the destination so bad that I kept interfering with my capacity to even think about it but not being able to ignore these things I didn't understand, the fact that I didn't understand them, and, and being too proud to ask someone to explain it to me. And my dad being not really, <sighs> not really a very good teacher, I mean, in, in some ways. I I'd never speak one ill word about him doing that shit at all, but, um, He expected me to just figure it out, basically. You know? I feel a little let down by my childhood. Not by my parents or any people, by the time period.
Of course, in other ways. I wouldn't have wasted me like that. I wouldn't have let that kid back. Oh. But I did. <laughs>